Despite the many changes transforming the movie business, the Hollywood studio system continues to make money. In fact, since 1963, Americans have purchased roughly 1 billion movie tickets each year. Pre-COVID gross revenues for North American box office sales climbed to nearly 11.9 billion, with global box office revenues hitting a record high of 41.7 billion in 2018. The cost of producing films has also risen, forcing studios to find ways to generate more revenue to produce movies profitably. On top of that, with 80 to 90% of newly released films failing to break even at the domestic box office, studios need a couple of major hits each year to offset those losses. Box office sales are the most obvious way that films make money. People buy movie tickets, and 40% goes back to the studio, with the theater keeping the rest. With the average movie ticket priced a little over $9 in 2018, the studio keeps less than $4 per ticket. A second way studios make money is through sales to the home viewing market, including video on demand, subscription streaming, and Blu-ray and DVD sales and rentals. These sales typically begin three to four months after a theatrical release and generate more revenue than domestic box office for major studios. Next is the fees premium cable channels like HBO and Showtime, as well as network and basic cable, pay for the rights to play a studio's movies. Studios and premium cable reach what are called output deals, where the channels have exclusive rights to show new movies for a specific time period. This can be big money makers for the studios as pay TV providers typically pay between 10 and 12% of the US box office for each film, up to 200 million. Foreign distribution is another big moneymaker. At record-breaking 298 billion in 2018, international box office gross revenues were more than double those of the United States and Canada. Numbers continue to climb annually, even as other countries produce more of their own films. Studios also make money by distributing the work of independent producers and filmmakers who hire the studios to gain wider circulation. Independents pay the studios 30 to 50% of their box office and home viewing revenue that they make from the movies. A final way studios make money is through licensing and product placement. Marvel and Star Wars are among the top selling toy properties in the world. Companies also pay studios to have their products prominently placed in a movie, such as the rumored $45 million that Heineken paid to be featured in the 2012 James Bond skill, James Bond film Skyfall. By now you shouldn't be surprised to learn Hollywood still has a big five although memberships has shifted a little from the early part of the 20th century. Disney, which bought 21st Century Fox in 2019, Warner Brothers, Universal, Columbia Pictures, and Paramount control nearly 87% of the revenues generated by commercial films in the United States, along with more than half of the movie market in Europe and Asia. This image from the Campbell textbook shows the market share of U.S. film studios and distributors in 2019, with Disney taking the biggest chunk of the pie. Now adding in Fox, Disney controlled more than 36% of the market, with such film franchises as Star Wars, Pixar, Marvel, X-Men, Avatar, and Disney. Warner Brothers and New Line are responsible for the DC movies, as well as the Harry Potter and Lord of the Ring franchises. NBC Universal is roughly tied with the Warner Brothers companies for second place, with its DreamWorks animated films and the Jurassic Park franchise. Sony Pictures has the Spider-Man and Jumanji films to their credit, while Paramount rounds out the Big Five with Titanic and the Transformers franchise. Independently owned Lionsgate also captured 3% of the market share with the Twilight and Hunger Games films. As for the all other independents category, 
only one shows up on the list of all-time domestic box office receipts. That's New Market Films, with their 2004 Mel Gibson-directed biblical drama, The Passion of the Christ. Synergy is the promotion and sale of a product through the various subsidies of a media conglomerate. It provides a powerful advantage to large movie studios. While vertical integration is a thing of the past, companies like Disney are going after horizontal integration to promote the new movies produced by its studios division, as well as books, soundtracks, calendars, t-shirts, and toys based on these movies. And Disney's doing a good job of it, purchasing Pixar, Marvel, Lucasfilm, and 21st Century Fox over a 13-year span. On the exhibition side, the five leading theater chains operate more than 50% of U.S. screens. AMC Entertainment, Regal Entertainment Group, Cinemark USA, Cineplex Entertainment, and Marcus Theaters own thousands of screens in suburban malls and at highway crossroads across the country, with most also expanding into international markets. In Durham, AMC owns South Point 17 at the streets of South Point Mall, and the Classic 15 Cineplex, just six miles north. Stadium 10 at Northgate is owned by the regional company, East Coast Entertainment, while the Carolina Theater is independently operated. By the 1990s, multiplex theaters with several screens in the same facility gave way to the Megaplex, containing 14 or more screens, upscale concessions, stadium-style seating, and digital surround sound. Theaters have continued to improve, offering IMAX and 3D screening options, reserved seating, plush, heated recliners, beer and cocktail options, and an expanded dine-in menu with food delivered right to your seat. The biggest challenge the movie industry faces today is the internet. After witnessing the problems illegal file sharing made from music labels, the movie industry was quicker to embrace online movie distribution. The popularity of Netflix streaming service led to the creation of others owned by major conglomerates, such as Disney's Hulu and Disney Plus, Warner Media's HBO Max, Comcast's Xfinity TV, Google's YouTube, Walmart's Vudu, and Amazon Video. The year 2012 marked a turning point as movie fans accessed more movies through digital online media than through physical copies like DVDs or Blu-rays. While streaming expenses are less than the production costs of physical media, the revenue is also lower. Another major change with film's digital turn is filmmakers have switched from expensive and bulky 16 and 35 millimeter cameras to digital video which eliminated the cost of buying and developing film. Between digital video and computer-based desktop editors like Adobe Premiere Pro, it's possible to make movies for a few thousand dollars and post them on venues like YouTube and Vimeo. From the earliest days of film, there were questions about how the medium would fit into society and how First Amendment free speech protections would or wouldn't apply to movies. As community and political leaders increasingly realized how powerful movies could be, they became concerned about how the power of film upset existing social norms. But a mid 20th century government crackdown on movies and those who made them would destroy lives and alter Hollywood for decades to come. In 1947, at the start of the Cold War with the Soviet Union, Congress began investigating Hollywood for alleged subversive and communist ties. The House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, coerced prominent members of the film industry to declare their patriotism and snitch on colleagues who may have been acting un-American. In November 1947, HUAC sent nine screenwriters and one director to jail for refusing to answer questions about their membership in various organizations and to identify communist sympathizers. The so-called Hollywood 10 were blacklisted by the major studios. Their careers in the film industry ruined. HUAC saw film as a powerful cultural tool that could threaten the status quo. 
it recognized the function of movies as consensus narratives, popular cultural products that provide us with shared experiences that can bridge cultural differences. Another issue to consider regarding the role of movies in a democratic society is how the American film industry dominates the movie watching experience of other nations. Some claim it's just an extension of a consensus narrative, creating a global village of a shared universal culture. Others argue the American film industry is stifling local cultures worldwide. As moviegoers, we also need to keep a critical eye on our own film consumption. While the political significance of movies is obvious in films like Michael Moore's Capitalism, A Love Story and Spike Lee's Black Klansman, the consensus narrative is arguably more powerful when audiences accept it without realization. For example, a typical Disney princess is a fragile and gorgeous creature that needs a handsome prince to rescue her. A lot of movies we grew up with didn't age well, filled with racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, homophobia, transphobia, white performers in non-white roles, and rape as a comedic subplot. Given the expanded viewing options and the increasing access to independent, foreign, and otherwise non-mainstream films, viewers can much more easily seek out alternatives to mass-marketed Hollywood films. With an entity as large as the U.S. film industry producing compelling messages about what we should value and how we should act, it's vital for those of us who consume movies to do so with a critical, media-literate eye and to seek out other cinematic voices.